Hello everybody and welcome to the first lecture in the series of the application of big data, machine learning and artificial intelligence and scanning probe and electron microscopy. So this lecture course is organized by myself and several of my colleagues who will be introduced along this presentation. And uh, this course aims to provide the overview of the historical developments in uh, machine learning and scanning probe microscopy. We started to work on it in uh, 2008. And uh, in the first several lectures, we will provide the historical overview of this field. We will start in this lecture with the overview of the unsupervised learning techniques in SPM for spectral imaging. We will continue in the second lecture with the supervised learning in SPM and uh, then introduce some basics of the linear unmixing methods. We will further proceed to discuss the machine learning in SPM image analysis and feature extraction, some applications of machine learning and scanning transmission electron microscopy, physics extraction from scanning transmission electron microscopy data, and the real-time feedback and uh, application for the atomic manipulation. So after that, we will start to present the lectures of the work that is currently undergoing in the Center for Nanophase Material Science, including the application of the deep learning in scanning transmission electron microscopy and SPM, creation of the libraries of images in the imaging techniques, and so on. Ideally, we plan to post about a lecture a week so that provides a real-time view of the work. And the important um, resources for these lectures are first and foremost Pycroscopy domain on the GitHub. So this is the place where our colleagues and uh, us post the codes that allow you to analyze your own images and datasets. The second resource is the library of scanning transmission electron microscopy images that is currently hosted on the Citrination platform. And of course, the Center for the Nanophase Material Science, which is the DOE user center, where you can just get an access to this imaging techniques and learn how to do this image analytics. In this introductory lecture, we are going to consider two initial points. The first one is where does the big data in scanning probe microscopy come from? And uh, I will illustrate it on the example of the band excitation scanning probe microscopies and time and voltage spectroscopists in SPM. Secondly, I will introduce the applications of the unsupervised learning and classification primarily using the principal component analysis. Note that this lecture series are not designed to provide the systematic overview of the machine learning techniques. Rather, they are designed to illustrate how the basic machine learning techniques can be applied for the realistic data. How do you develop this application? How you interpret the results? And uh, we will proceed from the application of simple PCA and k means clustering all the way to the backpropagation networks, to the deep learning, and to the reinforcement learning. You are also highly encouraged to go for the Coursera or EDX or Udemy to get a systematic background in the machine learning methods as a complement to this course. Now. Let's start with the basics of the scanning probe microscopy. So what is SPM? So SPM is based on a very simple concept of the pliable cantilever and a very sharp tip which is positioned on the end of this cantilever. So this is our force measurement system and this is our highly localized sensor sitting on the end of this force sensor. Then we have a laser beam that is reflected of the cantilever and falls on the photodetector. 
If we apply even a very small force to the tip, it will result in the displacement of the cantilever, and the even small displacement of the cantilever results in the large shift of the laser beam on the photodiode. In this manner, we can easily measure forces on the level of nanonewtons, and interestingly, this is the level of the forces acting between the atoms, so hence the name atomic force microscope. Add to this the fact that the end of the cantilever can be extremely sharp and uh, in principle can be one atom. That's how we get atomically resolved images. And here you have an AFM. So how would we use this approach for uh, measuring something? Let's consider a very simple example. Imagine that we want to measure the surface topography. All we do in this case is we use a feedback loop and feedback electronics in order to maintain the deflection of the cantilever constant while moving this cantilever tip assembly across the surface. And uh, as our feedback control, we use the position of the cantilever base. So if our force acting on the tip is constant, that means that the position of the cantilever base that we control with electronics actually retraces the surface topography. So think about it almost the same way as touching the surface with your fingers. If you close your eyes and move your fingers across your laptop keyboard, you will feel the laptop keys. So just by tactile feedback. So AFM works exactly in the same way. So this is of course the elementary principle and you are more than welcome to listen to the YouTube le lectures on the same channels that talk about more complex applications of SPM. And uh, just so you don't think it's uh, that easy, this is how the AFMs look like. So this is an example of ultra high vacuum AFM STM system. This is the example of the ambient AFM STM system. Now, what's interesting is that ultimately all atomic force microscopy techniques measure some cross-section of the force distance curve, meaning the force acting between the tip and the surface as a function of the tip surface separation. And in the last years, there have been a progressive transition to the three-dimensional imaging mode when the full force distance curve is measured. There is also the very active development of the dynamic SPM modes. And uh, what is really relevant to the further discussion, both in this and forthcoming lectures, is the forces acting between the tip and the surface uh, can be very well represented as the linear combination of individual interactions. For example, Van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces, magnetic forces, and so on. And this linearity is something that we are going to use very intensively in the forthcoming discussion. To the uh, band excitation scanning probe microscopy modes. So let's illustrate what this transition does to our data. So the simple example, the instrumental limit for scanning probe microscope is limited by the photodetector bandwidth, which is of the order of uh, 10 megahertz. The amount of data is difficult to estimate, but let's assume that we have a very good DAC card. And let's assume it's 32 bit card. So this is the maximum amount of data we can get from our microscope. The classical single frequency detection methods that are based on the lock and compression will reduce this data volume just to one kilohertz, meaning one data point every millisecond. The band excitation method will compress this data to something about uh, 100 kilohertz. So we collect 100 times more data. Finally, if we use what is called the G-mode scanning probe microscope, in this case, the full data stream coming to the photodetector is collected at the rate of about 10 megahertz. This sequence, single frequency, band excitation, G mode is just the engine of the SPM detection. On top of this engine, we can build the 
complicated time, voltage, uh, magnitude, and uh, other types of spectroscopies. So if we combine the development in the SPM engine and the SPM spectroscopies, we get this type of diagram, which shows the growth of the data size in SPM modes over the last 10 years. So about uh, 15 years ago, the typical volume of the data size was about a megabyte. And now we are progressing all the way to the 10 and 100 gigabyte files. We can collect many signals other than cantilever signal, for example, optical or mass spectroscopic. And the question naturally becomes, what are we going to do with all this data? So what is our approach? And here it is really important to make the difference between the physics and the big data approach for problems. Generally, physics is based on the causal approach to life. Why something happens? That's a classical question in physics. What is our hypothesis? How can we check it? How much do we trust the answer? The big data techniques use slightly different approach. In fact, very different approach. The big data technologies and machine learning generally explore the correlation. What phenomena is correlated with other phenomena? But generally, we don't know which is the cause and which is the effect. We always need to use the knowledge outside of the big data methods, so what is called the domain knowledge. Therefore, if we want to apply the big data machine learning or artificial intelligence for physical measurements, we need to proceed through several steps. And the first step, of course, is to explore the big data aspect of the problem. How do things happen? And to do that, we can use the unsupervised learning techniques, visualization, and the biggest hurdle here is the language and elementary tools. So in our experience, the language of our physics colleagues and our big data colleagues start to diverge somewhere in early college stage. However, once you go to the analysis of the big data, you can start to combine the big data and physical principles and uh, go to the point of how can we understand. So in this uh, combination gives rise to the physics informed data analytics and supervised methods. And in this case, the biggest hurdles would be the mathematical framework, scalability of the computational tools and so on and so forth. And of course, the advantage of the automatic big data and deep data methods is that we can implement them as the part of the microscope operation. So this is a start to the feedback and the expert artificial intelligence systems. We know that technologies such as Google Car or Uber Car exist, so there is no reason why is it impossible to make a self-driving microscopes. Now, the difficulty here is, of course, that before we do all that, the starting point is how we are going to get big data. So if you use your cell phone and your Facebook and your Google, then you provide the data to the AI companies. If you run a microscope, the microscope normally is not connected to the internet. So making the imaging tool a part of the data infrastructure is a really important step. And uh, that's basically something that you have to do. And uh, I'm not going to talk about how it is done because for each microscope, it's a separate approach. Now, let me start with the first example that led us to the development of the big data techniques in scanning probe microscopy. And this is the example of the band excitation SPM. So where does the band excitation come from? The reason is very simple, that in scanning probe microscopy, there is a huge advantage towards the operation at the cantilever resonance. And the reason for that is that this is the red curve here, is the example of the cantilever transfer function. So the small interaction occurring at the frequency corresponding to the resonance would be amplified by the Q factor or ideality factor of the cantilever. 
And this Q factor can be anywhere between 600 for ambient operation to hundreds of thousands for the operation in the ultra high vacuum. Secondly, operation at this resonance frequency takes us away from the 1 over F noise in the system. So that's a great way to increase the sensitivity, utilize resonance detection, obtain the dynamic data, and so on and so forth. The problem with the classical application of the resonant enhancement is that it can be implemented directly only in a limited number of systems where the driving force acting on the system is constant. Practically, it's not always true, and uh, in the lectures on the Kelvin probe and the um, piezo response force microscopy, we discuss in detail why the classical mechanisms for the resonant enhancement do not work for all SPM techniques. So the question becomes, how can we implement the universal method for the resonant frequency measurement in SPM? And let's look at the detail. This is how the classical SPM system work. We excite the system using the single frequency signal and we detect the response in the time domain at the same frequency. Practically, we are using the lock-in amplifier to extract the amplitude and phase at this driving frequency. So this is very simple principle. This is how SPM operated 30 years ago, and this is how most of the SPMs operate now. The problem is, of course, that the sinusoidal signal corresponds to just one frequency in the Fourier domain. So this is just a delta function. And when we operate at this frequency, we don't know what happens in the other frequencies. It's like looking at the world through the monochromated filter, through the notch filter, then you don't see the colors. You see just uh, one color. Or trying to make a picture of what happens around you by uh, looking through a very narrow slit. That's really not a good way of finding out what goes on. So the question that Stephen and uh, I asked ourselves about 10 years ago was, can we improve it? Can we get a detection operating at multiple frequencies at the same time? And that's exactly the idea beyond the band excitation. So what we want to do here is to create our excitation signal that has a band of frequencies, use this signal in order to uh, transform it into the time domain, and we send this time domain signal to our AFM signal. We detect the response in the time domain. We collect uh, this signal and transform it into the Fourier domain as the amplitude and phase. And voila, rather than measuring the signal at just one frequency, we measure the signal at multiple frequencies at the same time. So this is a transition from the single frequency detection to the parallel detection. Let me show you an example of how this uh, band excitation scanning probe microscopy can work for the special case of technique called magnetic force microscopy. So magnetic force microscopy, or MFM, is the technique that was developed about 25 years ago in order to study the magnetic interactions and the magnetic domain structures in solids. And the idea here is very simple. So the first uh, step, scanning probe microscopy tip retraces the surface profile, kind of determines the surface topography. Then the tip is raised at some predefined height, something of the order of 30 to 300 nanometers, and uh, it retraces the surface topographic profile while maintaining constant tip surface interaction. During this interleave line, the cantilever is vibrated mechanically, and the thing is that when it is far from the surface, it doesn't feel any van der Waals or other forces. So the only interaction it feels is magnetic and electrostatic. And uh, during this interleaf scan, we measure either the amplitude and phase or the resonant frequency shift, depending on what kind of detection we have. 
and these uh, signals become dependent only on the magnetic force acting between the tip and the surface. And in this manner, we can measure the stray magnetic fields about the sample surface. And these stray magnetic fields are directly related to the magnetic domain structure. So this is how it works. This is the example of the amplitude and phase of the MFM signal above the uh, yttrium iron garnet surface. So the surface is absolutely flat. I'm not even showing the surface topography. There is nothing to look there. However, the amplitude and phase show a very beautiful flower-like domain uh, system. So this is a classical magnetic domains in the garnets. And what's interesting, if you look at the phase signal, you start to see that there are small round objects here, which are perfectly reproducible. In fact, we can zoom in on one of those objects and we can see that there is some change in the cantilever phase while it interacts with the surface. And the question is why? So what, what happens? After exploring this issue for quite some time, we know that what happens here is that the material contains a small number of the magnetic dissipation centers where the cantilever falls in the micromagnetic resonance and start to lose energy because of the orientation of magnetization in the center. So we kind of know where it comes from in general. We don't know the exact nature of the centers. The question is, how can we make this imaging better? How can we get the quantitative information on the micromagnetic imaging? And the answer is, we can use it using the band excitation method. So this is the comparison of the type of information we get from classical magnetic force microscopy. So this is topography. As advertised, nothing interesting happens here. It's essentially flat. This is the MFM phase image. And these are the two signals that our classic microscope will give us classically. If we do the band excitation measurements, we will collect the amplitude frequency curve across the whole surface. And then we can fit this curve by the simple harmonic oscillator model and get the amplitude, the frequency, and the Q factor. So the amplitude is the complex signal that depends both on dissipation and conservative interaction. The frequency shift tells us something about the conservative magnetic interaction between the tip and the surface. And the Q factor tells us the losses that cantilever experience in the vicinity of the surface. So it tells us how much uh, magnetic power is dissipated inside the material. So once we got this data set, we got highly excited because instead of one image that is very difficult to interpret and is somewhat unstable, we start to be able to separate our signal into the components which are much more reliable and have much better defined physical meaning. However, if we think about it, this separation is not ideal. And the reason for that is that we already postulate that the dynamics of the tip surface system can be represented as a simple harmonic oscillator. And we don't know whether it is true or not. So the question is, how do we check? In other words, how can we get an insight in the tip surface interactions without making any a priori assumptions of what the physical model corresponds to this data. Are there alternative ways to convert the three-dimensional data set in the two-dimensional images that we can look at and explore while preserving the relevant variability? So let me show you what we talk about, what I talk about. Imagine that we are going to take this band excitation measurements across one line, let's say X pixel, across the sample surface. So we have a data set where we have a position in X along one direction, frequency along a different direction, and then the contrast shows us the strength of the interaction. And as you can see, the interaction doesn't change all that much, and it's kind of to be expected. Of course, realistically, 
we do these measurements not only as a function of x position, but also as a function of the y position. So basically, rather than having a, a one slice of data, we have a data cube as shown here. So we have a three-dimensional data set, or we can call it a data cube or multi-dimensional data set. So there are many ways we can call it, or if you will, hyperspectral data set. The question becomes, can we somehow explore the internal structure of this data set without making any assumptions or doing some controlled assumptions about what the physics of the imaging process is? So how can we do that? How can we reduce it to something that we can analyze? And it turns out that what we are going to do is to use the what is called the principal component analysis or PCA. And this is really important technique because this is the most simple of the multivariate statistics or big data methods. And it also falls the foundation for more complex ones. So I strongly encourage you to uh, explore what PCA is on the Wikipedia. It has a very good discussion of the principle and meaning of the PCA. And uh, here I'm just going to show very uh, brief highlights of how it can be used. So in order to use the PCA, first of all, we take our data cube and we basically flatten it to make a two-dimensional array where one axis is the total number of pixels in the image. So this is n square. And the second axis is the total number of the frequency bins. Then we calculate the covariance matrix between this data set, which describes the relationship between all these uh, pairs of spectra. So the on diagonal values of the covariance matrix is the information. The off diagonal is covariance or redundancy. And then we perform the uh, singular value decomposition of this matrix. Practically, it is, can be done using the singular value decomposition of MATLAB if you are a MATLAB person, or using the PCA function in scikit-learn if you are a Python person. So initially, all our software was development in MATLAB, and over the last five years, we transitioned to Python because it is, allows us to work with a supercomputer and uh, machine learning tools in Python grow much faster. But even in MATLAB, the analysis is essentially four lines of code. We define the singular value decomposition of our data. So it's important to use this econ mode because otherwise uh, computer can crash because of not enough memory. We reshape our data set and we define the U matrix, S matrix and uh, eigenvalues. Roughly, the PCA process can be uh, represented as taking our original data set and uh, uh, aligning it in the directions of the maximal variance and finding the relative contribution of different dimensions and uh, kind of uh, rotations. As I said at this point, just um, look at the Wikipedia page and we are going to return to the PCA over and over throughout this uh, lecture. And this is what the output of the PCA analysis on the band excitation MFM data looks like. The first thing we get is so-called scree plot that tells us how is the information in the experimental data set distributed as the function of the component. So it turns out that most of our information is contained in the first three components. So you can see that eigenvalues corresponding to first one is very large second is small, a third is small, and then they start to form this kind of continuous tail. So just examining this scree plot, we can see that all our data is combined, is contained in the first several components. Secondly, the PCA tells us what are the loading maps or abutans maps, depending on how you want to call it, corresponding to the first component, second component, third component and so on. And you can see that the first component, second component and third component has some spatial structure. 
So there is something interesting in these data sets. The fourth component, however, is essentially noise. We don't see any spatial structure here. And uh, if you look at the scree plot, you can see that this is point is already at the beginning of this tail, uh, PCA tail. So when we apply the PCA to the experimental data, there are three things that we look at. The first one is the scree plot. The second one, and the, the perhaps the most important one in the microscopy, are the spatial distribution of the loading maps. And the third one would be the eigenvectors corresponding to these loading maps. Now, one very important thing, and I will return to it over and over again, that the PCA is the purely information theory method. PCA components, strictly speaking, do not have well-defined physical meaning. In some cases, the specificity of the image formation mechanism in particular method would be such that they will resemble the physical components. However, this is not something to be taken for granted. Later in this lecture series, we will illustrate the examples of uh, uh, more complex multivariate methods, which, which come with some form of the physical meaning by design. However, this is not the case for PCA. It is optimized purely from the information theory methods and essentially assumes that we don't know anything at all about the physics of our signal. That said, in uh, certain cases, there is a deep resemblance between the PCA analysis and the functional fit analysis. And interestingly enough, band excitation MFM is example of this technique. So if you look at the PCA component, first, second, and third, and the band excitation amplitude, frequency, and Q factor map, you can see that they look very, very similar. They are not exactly the same, but they are remarkably close. For us at that time, it was very convenient because uh, 10 years ago, doing the full analysis by feet took us four hours and the PCA took us uh, less than one second. So there was a good reason to use the PCA to get initial guesses for the functional fits. Um, Eigen vectors for uh, first set and for the second set. And it turns out that the uh, Eigen vectors look very similar to the derivatives of the SHO function. So this is the comparison of the first, second, and third PCA component. So the first one looks like a function itself. The second one looks like a first derivative, and the third one looks like as a third derivative, and there are very good reasons for that. And it turns out that they're very similar to the in shape to the variational derivatives of the SHO function. And the reason for that is that PCA components are orthogonal, so they have to satisfy certain symmetry conditions. And the derivative of the SHO function satisfy very similar conditions. So in this case, there is a reason why the PCA components and the analysis of the classical uh, function fit method give very similar results. But as I said, this is accidental. This is not going to be the case for many other data sets. Nonetheless, now that we have this tool, let's have a look at another example of the data set, namely the magnetic nanoparticles. So in this case, this is the surface topographic data set. When we see the heights, the amplitudes, and the MFM phase. And this is the classical magnetic force microscopy data. So you can see that each of these nanoparticles look a little bit like a bull eye, so there is some interesting micromagnetic structure inside those. This is the example of the SHO fit on the band excitation data. So we see some drift in the amplitude data set. We can see very clear variation of the resonance frequency, so there is some uh, internal domain structure. At the same time, the uh, Q factor 
basically shows doesn't show us much so you see some variation of the contrast but nothing spectacular so what it tells us is that the magnetic domains inside those nanoparticles are pinned and uh, there is no additional dissipation because of the domain wall motion during the scanning so this is a rigid magnetic domain structure and in fact if we look at the same data set using the principal component analysis we come with a similar conclusion so we can get the maps of the first second third and fourth pca component for the amplitude and phase we start to see the internal contrast within the data set we can see that most of the information is uh, contained inside the first two data sets and again our uh, eigenvectors tell us that allow us to separate the data in some components which have the physical meaning which is really difficult to decide so in this case pc essentially serves as the exploratory data analysis tool that allows us to visualize and explore multi-dimensional data set what's interesting is that the pca analysis allowed us to separate the drift component this actually happens very often so we've been applying pca for spectral data sets for over 10 years now and uh, one of the useful properties of the pca is that some of the components tend to separate drift and some components tend to separate the noise for example if your data is corrupted by 60 cycle noise uh, this noise would be uh, concentrated in two PCA components, the one component and the component shifted by 90 degrees, so sine and cosine. Now, let me show you a little bit more complex example where we use the principal component analysis on the band excitation data in PS response force microscopy. So again, PCA is discussed in detail in the lecture series on PFM. However, here we just briefly recap that in PFM the tip is put in contact with the surface. We apply the bias to the tip and that results in the cantilever deflection due to the electrostatic and the piezoelectric interactions. And in this particular case, we applied the PFM on the biological object in liquid environment. And the thing about liquid is that there are a lot of uh, electrostatic and uh, electrochemical interactions. And uh, if we perform the measurements on the uh, hotspot that we can somehow detect on the material surface, a spectra from the adjacent position, you can see that the difference between the spectra is actually very, very limited. So we have a very huge data set where the functional form of the response does not follow the simple harmonic oscillator model or any simple model for that point and uh, we can visually based on topography identify interesting locations we can show that the response in these locations is slightly different we can get the three-dimensional uh, hyperspectral data set of responses in each point question is how we are going to visualize it to highlight this variation and it turns out that pca works like a charm in this case in fact if we collect our three-dimensional data set and perform the principal component analysis even though we don't know the functional form of the response we can clearly visualize the variability of the response along this amyloid fiber and show that there is a small number of hotspots with interesting responses and then we can use this uh, data set as a mask to choose the response corresponding to red pixels here or red pixels here you can see that the difference between these responses is remarkably small it shows up only in this very narrow frequency range and despite the fact that we don't know where to look at and what to look for pca allows us to separate the re different regions find the responses associated with these regions and tell us 
what is the relevant contribution of these different regions in the overall signal. So as an exploratory data analysis, it's absolutely fantastic. And you can learn more about this particular work in uh, this publication. So in general, the applications of the principal component analysis to the band excitation MFM uh, and uh, PFM are summarized in uh, these four publications. And you're welcome to look at them for additional details about the measurements or the method. Now, let me show you a slightly more complex example of the PCA applications for the switching spectroscopy PFM. So in the first part of this presentation, I talked about the band excitation, which is essentially the engine of scanning probe microscopy, which enables the detection at multiple frequencies at the same time. On top of the engine, we can also put the spectroscopies. And the simplest spectroscopy would be the switching spectroscopy PFM. So again, this technique is described in detail in the PFM lecture series. Here I just quickly recap it. So the way it works is that we have our tip in contact with the surface. We apply the waveform that looks like this to the tip. So this waveform is uh, switching the ferroelectric domains. And then after or at the high voltage pulses, we additionally detect the electromechanical response either using the periodic signal or the band excitation signal. And the sequence of events during this measurement, so at least idealize the sequence of events, this is what we want to measure, it goes like this. If we start, there is no domain below the tip. If we apply a bias pulse, we start to nucleate the domain of the opposite polarity and the response from the matrix and the domain start to counteract each other. So we have a nucleation bias on our hysteresis loop. If we keep applying bias, the domain will start to grow. At some point, the signal from the matrix and domain will cancel each other. So we have a coercive bias. If we keep increasing bias, then domain will become large and we basically can detect only the signal from the domain. If we start to uh, go in the opposite direction, so most of the time nothing happens until we start to switch the domain in the opposite direction. So we kind of get this uh, Russian doll domain geometry. And then the process uh, uh, continues until we completely uh, switch the material to the initial state. And during these measurements, our electromechanical response will follow this uh, hysteresis loops. And it turns out that this switching spectroscopy PFM is a wonderful tool for probing local bias induced phase transitions in ferroelectrics. So ferroelectrics are great because uh, this is a reversible transition, so it's a perfect model system. But the same approach can be extended to more complex systems, for example, electrochemical reactions and so on and so forth. Now, the important thing is that this uh, band excitation uh, detection can be combined with the switching spectroscopy. So here, for the readout, we are using the band excitation waveform, which contains a band of driving frequency rather than one frequency. So in this case, we necessarily get a four-dimensional data set because we have a XY. This is our spatial grid on which we perform the measurements. And uh, then we have our signal as a function of voltage, so the uh, switching waveform, and as a function of frequency because band excitation detects a signal at multiple frequencies at the same time. So if we run this band excitation switching spectroscopy, or BIPS measurements, we get a four-dimensional data set. And typical size of this data set can be anywhere around a gigabyte. It can be acquired reasonably fast, so of the order of hour. And uh, the question is, of course, what are you going to do with a gigabyte of data? So notice that this data is relatively straightforward, but uh, 10 years ago, that was actually a problem because the desktops at that time could not handle such data volumes 
easily. More importantly, there are a lot of very good physical reasons why we want to make the spectroscopy is more complicated. For example, if we want to measure the Preissach density inside the material or probe the kinetics of the transition, in this case, our spectroscopy becomes five-dimensional and the data sets start to go into the mid gigabytes sort of 30 gigabyte levels and uh, we can easily get the data uh, configure the microscope to acquire up to the terabyte. The question is how do you analyze it? And the answer is that we can do it using the analysis of the using the principal component analysis. And this is actually the example of a more complex data set where we explore the phase transition inside the material by applying not only the switching spectroscopy but creating the hysteresis loops with progressively increasing uh, bias window. And you can see that if we detect our data in the off-field regime, we see the normal response. But in the on-field regime, we see that our response strongly depends on bias and we see a strong resonant frequency shifts. And the reason why this is happening, because we have a field-induced phase inside the material that can be detected only during these frequency shifts. So again, the question is, how do we analyze this type of data sets through the systematically? And let me show you an example of the data on the specific material, the hydrogen exchange lithium niobate, where we collected this type of data sets over the spatial resolve grid. And even looking at the data after the switching, so the domain pattern, you can see that something interesting happened. So in the central region, we didn't have any domains formed because this is a hydrogen exchange material, it's not ferroelectric. In this region, we see that switching happened everywhere. And in this region, we see that switching happened only in some of the locations. So we have a very good reason to expect that something interesting goes on. And there are some interesting behaviors that depend on the distance from the hydrogen exchange region into the hydrogen non-exchange phase. In fact, we can map the area under the hysteresis loop and we can see some interesting concepts. Contrast. We can also get the representative hysteresis loop from blue region, so the blue curve, and the red region, the red curve. And you can see that there is some systematic variability, but the question is, can we somehow analyze it? Turns out that one way we can do it is by looking carefully and painstakingly on the structure of the hysteresis loops. For example, we can take the derivative of the hysteresis for the outer loop and we can see that there is a for positive direction we have uh, one position of the critical bias for the uh, negative one we start to see the splitting which represents the change in the material response. But this type of data again it allows us to visualize the part of material behavior but really doesn't tell us that much. However, if we do the principal component analysis, lo and behold, we can clearly separate this very complete data set into the just three components. It turns out that we have one component that is maximal in this region and behaves like a normal ferroelectric switching. We have a second component that shows up only in the other uh, data set. So notice that they have opposite signs. So uh, kind of positive is negative and negative is positive. And then there is a third component which describes the gradual transition between these two types of behaviors. Notice, and I repeat this like a mantra, the PCA does not have a well-defined physical meanings unless you go through all the generated physics of your imaging process in order to understand it. However, being able to reduce the data set that has uh, hundreds of the degrees of freedom to just three relevant components tells you that our problem can be significantly simplified. We don't need to understand all the meaning of the hysteresis loop in the system. We just need to understand the mechanism 
that lead to the formation of the linear combination of this data set. That's already a very big step forward towards the solution of this problem and stand by for publication when we actually talk about it. Now, you can learn more about these uh, methods and applications of the multivariate statistics to the piezo response microscopy in these publications. Now, let me show you a few more examples of the application of the simple machine learning methods for the different form of the scanning probe microscopy data, namely the current voltage spectroscopies in the scanning tunneling microscopy. So in this case, uh, STM is a great technique for mapping the structure of materials on the atomic level. So these measurements are done in the ultra high vacuum and using this big uh, scary looking machine that I showed in one of the first slides. We can use this method in order to visualize the atomic structure. So what you see on this image, the small balls here are actually the individual atoms on the surface of the layered superconductor. And uh, what we can do is we can explore the electronic structure of this material by measuring the current voltage curve in each point. So there are two modes in which we can run our STM. One is the structural imaging when we perform measurements at one voltage, but go for the high density of the spatial pixels. Another is the so-called CITS mode where we go for a very small number of special pixels, but at each pixel we collect the full IV curve. And what's interesting is that if we look at this IV, uh, this data set, you can see that there is a difference in the IV curve in this red spot and the blue spot. However, the difference is relatively small, so we can plot them side by side and see that the tunneling spectroscopy in the bright location and dark location differs very, differs very little. So the question is, how can we get insight into this variability? And the answer is, PCA is a great start. We can take this data set, send it to the same three lines of the MATLAB code, and lo and behold, we separate our data set into the maps that show the variability and shows some special structure inside this material. Again, we cannot derive any physical conclusions based on this data. In fact, in some of the future presentations, I'm going to show you an example when we use a slightly more complex methods of the multivariate analysis of the hyperspectral data. And by power of examination, we manage to connect it to the physical meaning. In the follow-on presentations, we will talk more about the matching and fitting of physical models to experimental data using the multivariate methods. But again, all of these methods start with the PCA as the way to explore the spatial variability of the data. And interestingly enough, it works. It shows us the result and tells us what is the characteristic size of the regions of the uniform behavior. It shows us where the variability happens in the real space. Now, PCA is a decomposition, but sometimes we don't want to decompose our signal, but we want to just group them in the sets which are alike. So this is called the clustering, and the easiest and most widely used approach for clustering is so-called k-means clustering. So basically what we want to do is to take our data set and separate into the k clusters, which are more similar. So again, you can find the uh, description of the k-means clustering in the, on Wikipedia. It's very intuitive. The codes for the k-means clustering, it's very simple. So it exists in MATLAB and it exists in Python and scikit-learn. This is the example of how this k-means clustering looks at the same data set. So we can take our IV curves, we can separate it in the four clusters and we can represent it as the integrated image and Lo and behold, it tells us what is the characteristic size of the regions with the alike behavior. And using some mathematical tricks, we can figure out 
how many clusters we want to de separate our data in. So again, I will talk more about this in the follow-on lectures and you can read more about this particular work in uh, this publication. And uh, thank you for your attention and uh, stay tuned. So the next lecture that will appear in a week from now would be the overview of the application of the backpropagation neural network for supervised learning in STM. So thank you for your attention and uh, talk to you next week.